Hello and welcome to episode 6 of the second season of the Detours in Music podcast. I'm your host, Laura Rupel, and today we have an interview with Phil Popham, composer, conductor, and performer. I hope you enjoy. Uh, well, I'm Phil Popham. Uh, I am an oboist and English horn player uh, out in Los Angeles. I do, uh, I do work for film and television scores, and I also conduct and compose um, as well. I've had symphony jobs, and I play uh, all sorts of gigs under the sun from bars to concert halls. So <laughs> it's, uh, and write music for those shows. Also the music director for a group called Helix Collective. So I'm uh, their conductor and their co-founder. Um, can you talk about your start in music? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, you know what it was? It, it, this was bizarre. Um, I always kind of liked music, uh, you, you know, just listening to it as a kid, uh, not necessarily classical, but all sorts of different types. Um, and I went to a play, uh, a, a version of Oliver in New Orleans at the Le Petit Theater. And I don't know why, I really don't know what possessed me to do this, but I sat right up in the front row by the orchestra pit. And the guy sitting right in front of me was playing the oboe and English horn. Mm, okay. And I had never heard anything like that before. It sounded so awesome. And, you know, I'm, you know, like this 12, 13 year old kid, you know, um, listening, to, listening to Van Halen and other and uh, Africa by Toto and things like that. But I, I, heard that, I heard this and I thought it was just incredible. So I asked the guy at intermission, I said, you know, what are you, what are you playing? What is that? And uh, I have a lot more respect for this now than I did then, but he took the entire break to talk to me and tell me about the oboe and English horn and all about it. Um, and I remember in, being in the car, uh, going back home and just having those oboe lines just stuck in my head, you know, and, and the sound of it and how cool it was. And so that was sort of the, the very beginning of it. Um, I didn't actually switch over to being a musician at that point. Um, it, it, be, it came much later, right about my, it was around my sophomore year of high school that I started playing oboe. Um, but it had always been sort of in there. Um, and what happened, I went to a, I, 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 this is odd, and I didn't think about it. Mm -hmm. You asked these questions and I was, and I was thinking about it. And it, it, I just realized it now, so I have to thank you for this. I realized it now that, I went, it was at the same theater. It was called Le Petit Theater in New Orleans. Same exact place, maybe 30 feet from where I was sitting when I first heard the oboe, maybe about you know, a few rows back. Mm -hmm. And I was watching um, a play of, of uh, the Shakespeare Midsummer Night's Dream. And it was at the very end where Puck runs out at the end and says, you know, if we shadows have offended at the very end, um, you know, and it, and it was, you know, the, this woman, she was all decked out in makeup and costume. The lights were all crazy. It was an incredible production. Mm -hmm. And uh, that just, that kind of shook me. That moment sort of was like, wait a second, this is incredible. This is magic. This is everything. And I said, so I want to, so I kind of made it my decision that I wanted to, you know, make magic, you know, make these magical worlds that people would feel all of these things. Um, and so I looked over, uh, I uh, looked over at, uh, you know, the oboe and English horn rattling around in my head uh, for a few years and decided to start playing oboe because uh, I thought that would be the best way to do it. <laughs> yeah. Did you start um, just with your high school? Um, yeah, well, I, yeah, what happened, I had a, <laughs> yeah, it was a little odd. Um, I had a copy, well, I, I got an oboe. <laughs> Um, or, or we rented one. I, we must have rented it, I guess. Um, and I had a fingering chart and a copy of Flight of the Bumblebee. Mm, okay. And so uh, I spent a summer just kind of trying to figure it out. I mean, I didn't have any lessons or a teacher. I wasn't in a band or anything like that. So I just kind of, you know, Flight of the Bumblebee happened to cover most of the fingerings you would need to know. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I just kind of, it must have sounded awful. But, you know, anyway, I tried to do it. Um, and I learned how to, to play oboe, and uh, the the orchestra, held, the Louisiana Philharmonic, uh, uh, held an held an odd set of auditions to take lessons with their players. Mm, okay. And I, this was right around the time I saw that that Midsummer Night's Dream, and I said, "Okay, I want to try to do this. Like, I want to try to make this something and and mm -hmm. do something with it." So here's the way. So I must have sounded awful, but anyway, I played this audition. Um, it must have been terrible, but uh, uh, this member of the orchestra, he was the bass trombone player of, of all people. Um, and he, to his, to his credit and my joy, he figured that I should be someone who got private lessons um, on oboe. Uh, and so I started studying with one of the players in, in the symphony. I, end, I ended up knowing all of them fairly well by the end, but 
uh, it was, uh, yeah, so that started my private lessons. It turned out I was blowing through the right end. Other than that, I had kind of, uh, <laughs> I hadn't gotten much else right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I, you know, it, it was a lot of fun. And I started, I started learning that the guy that I started studying with, um, his name was Adam DeSorgo. Uh, he, he's, he's still, he's still playing. He, oh yeah, you know, I've he's... met him. That's... Oh, you have, yeah. He yeah. was, he was second oboe in Louisiana Philharmonic at the time. So I started studying with him and he introduced me to uh, John Mack and all of that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that whole lineage. And it was uh, fantastic. And, and so, um, yeah, if that bass trombone player, his name was Richard Erb. He was married mm -hmm. to Helen Erb. Uh, who was the English horn player at the time. So, uh, you know, they, I eventually studied with her too after Adam uh, left uh, the orchestra. But uh, yeah, so it was, it was all really wonderful. And if, you know, if he had said no, I, I actually don't know where, what my life would be like today. Um, mm -hmm. If he had said, oh no, you know, kid, you don't know how to play this at all, but he saw something or, or something and, and I got lucky enough to do it, so. I'm sure um, since his wife was an oboist, he must have known that if you had the initiative to be doing as well as you were doing by yourself, that that was probably a good sign. <laughs> yeah, right. Or at least saying, like, if you've actually gone to this much trouble. Exactly. <laughs> like, he able... wants it enough. Let's, we'll try. Yeah, right. Yeah, if you if you've put up with it for six months, then, you know, maybe. <laughs> At home yeah. with a method book and an oboe in middle school. Um, and my middle school band director kind of had the like, you're not allowed to play with us until it's like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> a little bit what you're doing. Um, so I think a lot of oboists have kind of figured it out a little bit by themselves. And then you realize you like it enough, you want to try a little harder. Yeah, right. Exactly. And boy, will the oboe ask for it too. It'll really, <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't like half measures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's like your most, it's like your most, uh, your most insecure friend. If you spend like five minutes away from it, it gets all offended and starts treating you badly. Yes. You, you know, you thought about something else by mistake, you know, instead yeah. of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so after you started taking lessons, when did the shift into, oh, this is what I want to pursue um, professionally or in school? Well, yeah. Well, you see, that that was kind of a lucky thing. I, by starting so late, by the time I decided, by the time I had seen that part of the play and decided, oh, I want to make magic, and hey, this oboe is awesome. He's, it was already at that point that I decided I want to do this as a profession. Like, that was it. That's why I started working on it in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and so so everything I did was, was about that from the beginning. It was kind of like, okay, let me let me do this, let's do this, this is gonna be it. Um, mm -hmm. And I actually, I had, um, up until that point, I had, my, my plan in life was to become an airline pilot. I had actually built a, a cockpit in my room and knew all the procedures and everything, but I kind of had to decide between flight lessons or oboe lessons, you know, like, well, you know, I, you can't really do both. And so I chose right then and there before even really uh, playing the oboe that much, I was like, okay, this is, this is gonna be it. Like, and, mm -hmm. and I'm not, there's no, I already knew that there was no way to straddle the fence. I had to choose. I had to firmly choose one or the other. And so I, I sat up nights thinking, and the thing that tipped my brain over was uh, thinking about retiring when I was, you know, in my 70s or, or yeah, for obo 90s. Um, <laughs> and uh, I thought after a career in music, I would feel like I had done everything, that I had really lived a, an incredible life. And a career after being a pilot would have been awesome and it would have been fun but I would f still feel like I would have to do something else. Like I would have to have some other portion of my life, but for the oboe, I felt that that would be enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. So where did you attend university for oboe? That can be a question. Oh yeah, um, well, I went to the Peabody Institute in uh, Baltimore, <laughs> studied with Joe Turner, uh, who at the time was the, the principal of most of Baltimore Symphony. He's on all those Zinman recordings and all of that. Um, and he was he was only one of about four or five people that I wanted to really study with. I, you know, you know, being a young kid and knowing that I had a limited amount of um, auditions that I was going to be able to take, I really narrowed it down. And um, man, if you, if you hear that Baltimore Symphony recording of Benvenuto Cellini or mm. the Barber Cello Concerto or really any of the barbers that they recorded, oh man, the oboe just, it sounds like a million bucks. And so, mm. um, uh, you know, he was, he, he was so expressive uh, you know, uh, as he played there. He, he's still alive. He's retired now. I think he's bird watching and kayaking and doing fun things like that now. But uh, so anyway, I went to, I went to Peabody and uh, it was really for him that I went, but the school ended up being much better 
and I really felt at home there. It's, it's one of the only places I've truly felt at home. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't just because of, of him and the oboe studio, which was very supportive, but um, the, the other teachers ended up being really interesting. Um, there was a guy named Clinton Adams who did uh, ear training. And to this day, I am still going back to things that I had learned back then and saying, oh, you know what, this is, not only is this still pertinent to me, but it's still kind of difficult to do, <laughs> um, you know? And so I really valued how much he gave us um, how much he gave us that, that I'm still relying on today. Um, mm -hmm. Also, uh, Mark Weiser was theory, and he actually taught a class that was so awesome once. I had a dream that night of inviting all of my friends and family into that same class so they could experience it. So there was a lot of really good people around there, and I, I, I really enjoyed it. It was, it was the first time I was really around other musicians. Uh, you, know, the, you know, being an oboe player in New Orleans is not, you, 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 there's not like a huge bank of people to hang out with if you do that. And uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so this was it was really quite a wonderful time um yeah it was it was actually really hard in some ways because suddenly you're surrounded with all these incredibly talented people you know and so you want to you want to hang out with them you want to learn from them and you you go into the dorms and you know you would stay up all, I, I stayed up all night once uh with this guitarist this classical guitarist from curacao who were, I was playing him things like the Hindemith Symphonic Metamorphosis and Shasti V, and he was playing me like the guitar works of Nigel Westlake, and we were just trading music back and forth, listening to it and talking about it. And when you're in that sort of a setting, um, you know, how can you, how can you get up and go to 830 Theory? You know, like, I mean, uh, it's just like, you, know, you know, there was way, way more inspiring things to do uh, mm -hmm. than that. So I had to kind of work with that a little bit because uh, there were so many great people there to, to learn from. You know, mm -hmm. for the first time in my life. Yeah. You know, so, was it during this time that you started kind of branching out of just oboe? Because I know now you have such a diverse career. Yeah. Well, you know, that actually started at the beginning um, when I there was this little moment. Okay, so I started playing oboe. This kind of fills in that gap in between college and starting to play, um, which I was I was lucky I got into a college considering I had been playing for two and a half years. Um, and, uh, you know, again, if some, somebody had faith in me somewhere and, and let me slide in there. Um, but uh, the, uh, so yeah, I, I ended up after, after playing oboe for about uh, three months, three, four, well, no, I, I might've been, might have been nine months by then, anyway, something like that. Um, I auditioned for an arts high school, which was called the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts. Mm -hmm. And they, they also, through a leap of faith, sort of allowed me to come in and start studying there instead of a regular high school. So, mm -hmm. um, and what I did there is I began, uh, I, I began oboe, uh, conducting and composition all at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, that was kind of, um, not everybody did that, but there were, most of the classical students did that. We all went into all three of those at the same time and learned all of them from the start. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was always something I, I enjoyed doing on, on all three of them. And being an oboist, uh, you know, you sort of get, you sort of get that feeling of being a bit self-sufficient. You know, you mm -hmm. know, you have to make your own reeds, you have to gouge your own cane, then you have to adjust your own instrument. You have to, you know, do all of this stuff. We're always trying to bring everything in house so we mm -hmm. can handle it ourselves. And so here I was able to conduct, compose, and perform. Um, and it was actually at Peabody where, where they sort of said, hey, look, you know, because I said, like, I want to do a triple major, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I don't even think they had an undergraduate conducting degree at that point. Um, I, I, they still may not, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, but um, th they said, you know, choose one, you know, just, just do one, you know, let's get something right. <laughs> you know, um, and so I chose oboe because that was always, you know, kind of the initial thing that brought me in. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't long after that. It was sort of in my master's uh, and graduate years that I started to realize, like, I just, I couldn't turn it off. Like, it, it was still there. Um, yeah. I couldn't ignore it or turn it off. And so I started pursuing it again, especially after I had won my first set of jobs and was sort of in the, a little bit in the, I guess in the flow of it all and like okay another cycle another cycle and I was you know my heart wasn't beating out of my chest every time I went on stage with a bunch of cameras on me um, you know I, once I kind of was like oh yeah it's another Friday and Saturday then I then you know I started going more towards composition and, and conducting and all of that and bringing those back and I actually went back and got um, while I was in the orchestras I got a master's in composition uh, at the time just to 
kind of fill things out and, and, mm -hmm. and enhance that. So that's always been there. Um, that's always been there. And it was actually, I, you know, maybe I should have been more insistent uh, mm -hmm. to say, no, guys, I'm, but you know, it, it was, it was Peabody. I was going <laughs> to do whatever they said, you know, and it turns out that doing what people say isn't my strong suit. And <laughs> so, you know, it took me a, a little bit of time to realize I should stop doing that. <laughs> um, do you think your biggest struggle in your undergrad was balancing all of those different influences? No, no. Um, I, besides waking up early, um, which is still a struggle to this day. Um, um, besides that, I think the biggest struggle I had was was maybe a bit of a culture shock that, you know, in New Orleans, no one looks at their watches, you know? I mean, it, you know, if you, if you decide to meet people at three o'clock, they'll be there at 345 and no one's impatient, no one's yeah. waiting, it's just, you know. Um, but of course you move into the Northeast mm -hmm. and oh man, it's, you know, you know, four o'clock on the dot. What is it? What, what do they say? Like, where did I, early is on time, on time is late. It's that, that's what, that's it's a big, yep. <laughs> yeah. and, and that was so foreign to me. I was like, no, it's not like on time is on time. That's why they call it on time. And, you know, and then I'd be like, it's 4.15. You haven't even started yet. I haven't missed yeah. anything, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> so coming, coming to terms with that, it mm -hmm. was really hard for me because to me, that was part, part, part of music was the, the flexibility of time and the creative process and inspiration and yeah. taking, the, taking the time to dream accurately or, or dream vividly enough that you could bring it into the real world. Mm -hmm. So this kind of... Uh, you know, conveyor belt sort of system, it, it, it really didn't jive well with me. And it, it was, a. I, I'm not sure I ever really got it. I mean, it's, I, I'm not sure. That's a question for Joe Turner, if I ever actually at any point uh, was punctual and uh, was punctual enough for him. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm honestly not sure I ever was, but I did try. <laughs> What's some um, advice you have for younger musicians who maybe are going through some similar things you were going through or um, have a lot of diverse interests and are told, you know, pick one. Um, yeah, I mean, if things aren't going as expected, I mean, you know, you know, number, get in line. I mean, <laughs> yeah, join, join the club. It's a big one. Um, but, but I would say one of the, the most important things is, is, is you know, ex one, expect it. Things aren't going to go the way you, you planned. Probably, probably not. And, mm -hmm. and the, the, the big misnomer about that is that in some way that's bad. It's actually not bad at all. Mm -hmm. This is kind of how you're going to just, this is how you're going to find out what unique things you can offer the musical world that are missing. Because you are going to be thrown in a lot of different positions that you didn't think with limited resources. And you're going to have to try to figure out what is most important to you to do. Like, you know, is it important for you to be, you know, playing notes on the instrument or is it important for you to be expressing some sort of message or get some sort of art, artistic purpose out there? And if so, what is it? Mm -hmm. And so it'll force you into that. Um, so I would say, one, don't be discouraged if, if you're, you know, if, if, if things aren't going the way you expected. This is a moment of, of ultimate creativity and how you, you pull from your skills to create the solution is gonna be something that defines you and something that you'll always have with you. And so don't be afraid of it and don't be mad about it. Um, you know, you know, but accept it as par for the course. No one talks about it, but every single person, whether they are one of the, the whether they're a Grammy winning composer or in the top of the symphonies, they've all been through a very unexpected path. And they just don't talk about it in their bio because mm -hmm. they get, you know, 500 characters and they're like, I studied at Juilliard and then I won principal of New York. The rest is irrelevant. And it's like, mm -hmm. no, that's actually the most important part is all the other stuff that happened. But they don't say that because, you know, they don't want to. Um, <laughs> so just understand that everyone went through that. And it, it's, this is going to be what defines your personal journey. And it's going to be what defines you as an artist of what your abilities are and what your priorities are. Mm -hmm. um, if people are telling you to limit what you do, um, you know, the politically correct thing to do would be to say, oh, you know, yes, teacher, of course, I'll, I'll do that. But, but don't, uh, really don't do that. I mean, you need to appease them because they, for, for some bad reason, people think that if you do a bunch of things, you're not focused. You're, mm -hmm. you're not focused on one thing or you're gonna be distracted by another thing. And it's really not true. 
the, the reality is, is that I've learned more about playing oboe from talking to actors and movie directors than almost anybody else. Mm. I've learned more about being a performer by, you know, looking at, watching dance performances and going to museums and taking in visual art. I've learned more about performing from there than I have from being in an orchestra. Um, and I've learned more about composing and conducting from sitting in an orchestra than I ever have from any conducting teacher. Mm -hmm. um, because I know what musicians really need and what they don't need. Because I was sitting in there forever needing it or not needing it. So, um, you know, I, I, so I would say don't limit yourself at all. It, you know, you can say you're going to do that because that's what somebody wants to hear and you want to appease them. But you, you have to pursue it because you can learn so much more from doing those other things and get perspective from it. And, yeah. um, you know, I think, I th yeah, I don't know, I think that's priceless. And, and also not everybody can do everything. I mean, yeah. there are, you know, and, and there are things I certainly can't do. Like, like for instance, I'm, I'm a terrible dancer. You would think that a, a, a musician, you know, who, who's a performer and, uh, you know, can write music and can write dances, can compose dances, um, would be able to dance. But I absolutely can't. I cannot do that. Um, but I've still learned a lot from watching dancers mm -hmm. um, in, in performing. So, you know, there are going to be things you can't do. So you don't have to go out and try to do everything. Mm -hmm. But if there are things that you feel drawn to that, that are giving you perspective, keep them at all costs. Mm -hmm. keep them at all costs because they're going to be with you all the time and and they'll help you out i mean uh when no one else knows the answer you'll have more of a bank to pull from to mm -hmm. make a good guess um yeah. and again you know somebody who's good at a skill that most people aren't if they apply that skill to performing that's going to be something even more unique that they can bring that can reach an audience that's needing that you know so it's not like Yelp reviews. No, none of the audience ever says, you know what I need in my life is more of, of this. They never tell us that. And so, but you can offer it if you have it. So, um, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I think it does. Um, in your adult life, have you ever considered a career outside of music? No, not in my, not in my adult life. Um, I mean, you know, most people say I'm not even completely an adult right now. So I, I guess that can be, <laughs> You know, it just depends. Uh, you know, people still tell me to grow up. So, uh, um, you know, but, it, you know, I think I've realized by now that, um, you know, I might as well just keep doing the same thing. I mean, it's, it's a little late, late, yeah. late to change of course now. Um, <laughs> you know, it's been working okay. Um, no, in my, in my adult life, no. I, I mean, I, I think that as long as I'm working in music in some way, oboe, conducting, composing, orchestrating, mm -hmm you know, recording, editing, you know, all those things that, 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 um, you know, yeah, I think I'm, I, th I think I've always been okay with that. I mean, I have thought every once in a while, like, what would I do if like, you know, I lost my hand or something like that, or, you know, what, you know, and, and I, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I really don't know what I would do. I would find something. I mean, that's the thing. It's not like I would be like, oh, I can't play the oboe. My life is over, you know. Um, you know, I'd be very sad. It's a big part of my, my personality and what I think is great in the world. But, um, you know, if it wasn't there anymore, th this is that thing of that varied path of having all these different things around you that you realize that the, the real sum of what you're trying to do in life is a lot greater than the parts. And that you can get there with or without any number of the things that you're relying on, mm -hmm. because it's a little bit bigger. Than, than just one of those things. Um, and that, I, I'd say that that's also important for the, the people, as you mentioned, that might be, be having unexpected things happen and um, things not maybe turning out the way they think. Mm -hmm. uh, is, yeah, it, it's just like, yeah, but if you, have your, your, if you have your eyes on the prize and you really know what it is you want and what you're going for, that's gonna help you know where to go from where you are, no matter where you are, even if you're way off course to you, are you really, or can you point yourself back and with what? Maybe not changing fields, but have you changed your career focus? Well, sure. I mean, I guess, I guess, you know, at, at Peabody, I was really like, I'm going to be a symphony oboist. And then I did that for 10 years. And I was like, you know what, like there's, there's something missing. As a matter of fact, I knew there was something missing before that, which is how I ended up with a master's in composition. But um, the yeah, the but yeah, I 
it was funny getting getting where I thought I wanted to go is when I realized I had to diversify. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I thought I knew where I wanted to go, and this is part of that story of trying to keep a bigger picture in mind. Always is that I had gotten what everybody wanted and what I had wanted and what everyone told me I should do and what wow, I, I did it, you know, mm -hmm. woohoo! And then, you know, you, you see, I don't know, you just, I, I realized, I realized after maybe five or six seasons that I, uh, playing in three different orchestras um, with very wonderful conductors and great colleagues and musicians that, 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 that I, you know, to this day uh, enjoy talking to and being around. But, um, the ultimate result of those concerts was missing something for me. And so I, I had to try to find it on my own. Um, mm -hmm. And that's when I started to uh, look back at composition. Uh, I tried to get some recording skills and tech skills so that I could be, again, kind of like an ob but like oboist with their instrument. Yeah. As a musician, try to be self-sufficient. Like, you know, I should have played piano. That would have been, I, it would have been so much easier, but <laughs> um, I, I would probably have sucked at it. But, you know, but, you know, when you're, when you're an, as an oboist sitting alone with an artistic vision that, that the ensembles around you are not providing, mm. um, you know, where do you go? Like, like, you can't put out a solo oboe album. I mean, you could, but would that really be, would that really be getting to the gist of what you were trying to do? Um, better than the orchestras, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I started to get into kind of, um, at first it, it was chamber music, getting other musicians around me, you know, and, and trying to build that. And then eventually it was um, electronic sounds and, and uh, uh, textures and colors and things like that, where I could write the music. I could have a multi-timbral accompaniment that did whatever I wanted it to do. And I could play as well the way I wanted to play, the way I thought could be played, mm -hmm. um, which, which doesn't always, you know, you know, the, you know, the, the symphony, you have to play a certain way. You really do have to play a, a very specific way. And then you also have a, the principals and the conductor and all of those people are, it's very social. It's very uh, community-based if it's done well. Mm -hmm. um, but from the English horn seat, it's hard to raise your hand and say, hey, maestro, couldn't we, couldn't we have the strings play that shorter and then have the cellos come in really long? And uh, you know, you don't, you can't do that. I mean, it's not, it's not how it works. So if you want that to happen now, you have to be your own producer. You have to, and, and to be a, be a producer like that, you need to have a lot more skills to a concert and play. And so I tried to gain as many as I could so I, I could do that. And it turns out I'm pretty good at sound editing, which I, I you know, I guess, you know, you, you, you listen to a bunch of pristine recordings and, um, you know, you, you have a good sense of that. You, you build your ear for that. Um, but things like recording, um, you, know, you know, where to put microphones and what kind of microphones to use and, um, you know, how to, how to mix and how to do EQ and compression and all these things that they never teach you in the classical world, but that are, are becoming more and more relevant. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, and, and it's true, like, you know, when I put out the Obolicious Funktacular, um, you know, I edited that myself, I composed it, I, I played on it, I recorded it, mixed it, mastered it, did the, did the album art, you know, everything. Now, if it went to a professional mixer and master, it probably would have sounded a little better. Yeah. But I would have lost some creative control over it. Um, and so I really made the call to say, okay, I know I can pay someone to do it the way that they think sounds good, but mm -hmm. let me try to make it sound exactly the way I want. And if it's not perfect, that's my own thing to develop on as I continue as an artist. I mean, you know, I'm, you know, hopefully you'll always be looking back at your former projects going like, oh, I should have done that because now you're thinking, you know, way further along than you were back then. Um, and it's not that you should go back and change them. It's just that you should know where, you know, have the perspective of it. So, um, uh, yeah, so, yeah, it was, it was about maybe four or five seasons in, in, into playing in orchestras that I realized that I needed something more. Um, and that it wasn't music's problem, that music was still just as good as it always was. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was that what I was, I thought the orchestra would provide what I was looking for, and then it didn't. And it's not necessarily a shortcoming of the orchestra, it's just, it was, it was just where our artistic paths didn't quite align as much. Yeah. Uh, where did starting your YouTube channel come into things? 
Um, you know, I'm trying to remember exactly why I, I'm trying to remember. I'd have to go back and look to see what my first video is. That would probably mm -hmm. tell me. I mean, I think, I think that it, it started very innocently mm -hmm. uh, it, where I had gotten some concert footage of myself performing in various places and was like, oh, this is cool. And hey, kids now are putting stuff up on YouTube. So I'll, I'll do that, you know, have it recorded and archived and documented that, oh yeah, look, Phil played, you know, Shasti Tan, here it is, you know. Um, and you know, that was maybe part, partially for me too to do. And, but, uh, yeah, and I, you know, the funny thing I remember is like, you know, I was sitting there as like, you know, this, this 24 year old person struggling to put a video onto YouTube, wondering how it was that fourth graders were putting YouTube videos up in their class. And I'm sitting yeah. here like as a, with a master's degree, like taking four hours to upload a 10 second video. Um, fortunately, I've gotten better now, but you know, back, back then I had to learn from scratch like everybody else. Um, but uh, what eventually happened is similar to creating the Fat Yak Records label was that, you know, YouTube, YouTube is a platform with mm -hmm. uh, a possible audience and a way to distribute what you're doing. So when I started going off book where regular labels and ensembles would kind of raise their eyebrows and say, oh, I don't know about that. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I still had a way to distribute and, and uh, to distribute and make accessible the things that I was producing and with no overhead, with, with mm -hmm. zero overhead cost. So it probably started like that. Um, and you know, the, it was the Fairling remixes that, that bulked up my subscriber count. Um, mm -hmm. That was kind of the first time, I think number 28 was the first one I did. And I sort of did it as, as kind of, you know, you know, you have to play those Fairlings all the time. And one of my artistic visions, or maybe, maybe it's the ultimate one, is to create, is to create enjoyment and fun out of possibly mundane and repetitive or boring tasks. Mm -hmm. Things that people have to do that they don't look forward to. I wanna to try to create an angle through music that makes it fun and exciting and enjoyable where they can almost look forward to it. And so that, that's always sort of been there for me for anything I do. Mm -hmm. And so that worked its way into having to do the Fairlings all the time because, um, you know, especially when I was starting out in LA, um, you know, you're at the bottom of all the lists. No one knows who you are. It didn't matter that I played in three orchestras. You know, who cared? Like, you know, do you know the people that I know? Have, does, has someone that I trust vouched for you? You know, I don't know who these orchestras are. So, you know, you, just like whenever you move and you have to start a freelance career and get to know people, things are kind of slow. Mm -hmm. And they, with the gigs here, um, you know, they're still writing them when you go into the studio. A lot of times the composer isn't even there. They're still writing the next thing you're going to play in the session while you're recording the thing they've already written. And some poor intern runs out with hot pages with wet ink and says, okay, here's the next one. <laughs> you know? um, and so what do you practice, right? I mean, you can't, you can't study the music like you can at school for a month and be like, oh, when the F resolves to the E on the German six, then it, there's no time. You can't do it. So the way to shape um, I said from Joe Turner, who always said that he took out Fairlings to stay in shape uh, while he played in the orchestra. Even though he was playing every single week a full cycle, it was a blow, but he still played the Fairlings. And he said they were, he said something along the lines of, whenever I've, whenever I've put them down, and I always remember that I should have been playing them when I played them, even with a full symphony schedule. There's something about them that is pretty good for the oboe. Mm -hmm. um, so, I was doing the Fairlings all the time in between random calls to do recordings, which sometimes, you know, two, three weeks apart, you know, you know, what are you going to play? Fairlings got boring. So, I mean, you know, really, so, I mean, it's like a little slow minor failing, right? It's yeah. like, oh, here's a minor phrase. Now, here's a major six chord, and then we're going to go into major. Here's your Neapolitan chord, the end. It's like every single one, right? Yeah. So, it's like... So, you know, you know, there's 48 of them, right? So I figured, okay, let's, let's make these fun. Let's, like, I don't like practicing. I, I don't like, I love performing. Mm -hmm. And I love performing well, but I hate practicing. I really don't like practicing. I never did scales and long tones because, because, oh my God, life is too short. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it's not that I didn't care about the skills that you could get from those. Mm -hmm. I just had to do it through a musical goal. I had to be thinking about my vision and my contribute and say, oh, well, 
if I want this to be artistic, then I, I have to be able to come in from nothing on a low G, you know, I have to be able to do that right now. So how mm -hmm. do I do that? Um, and so, yeah, so made the remixes that it made all of them a little bit different because you could change the accompaniments. You could have, you know, up to 30 to 60 instruments behind you if you wanted to on those with all of the, all of the tracks stacked up if you, if you really cared to. And, um, and, you know, it, it, it solved the problem too. A lot of people play with tuners and, and metronomes and stuff like that. If you have like the tuner going, holding a pedal, like an A through the A minor fairling, it's like, that's great. But if you're playing an E, you're gonna have to raise the E for it to sound good with the A. It's the fifth, right? So you'll, you'll bring that up a little bit. But what if it's a five chord? Then the E should be right about where, where it should be. Not, not high at all, because it's not the fifth anymore. And, and people who raise the leading tone, it's like, well, that's a lot of times the third of a major, uh, of a dominant chord, so it should be brought down, right? I mean, the exact opposite. So there's all these things yeah. that playing with a tuner doesn't cover. Um, and so I thought if I can change chords, if I could change chords in real time while playing the Fairlings and keep time, uh, like a metronome, then instead of a tuner and metronome, which will drive people batty, um, you know, musicians could now perform the Fairlings and have some fun playing it and feel like a musician instead of someone cooped up in a room, you know, playing the ob. Instead of feeling like an oboist, you could feel like a musician. Yeah. Right? I guess that was, and this repetitive sort of mundane task could become enjoyable in some way. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and so then it took off and then, you know, you start doing things like, oh, you know, I'll shade it blue when it's minor and then shade it orange when it's major and, oh, maybe I'll wear a hat or sunglasses during this part. And then eventually, you, you know, um, we got, I, I got a green screen and all of that. And so then I could be anywhere I wanted. And then I could record myself four times over and be in the same video with myself. I mean, you know, you just, you know, you just continue to develop it. And, uh, you know, uh, fortunately, uh, it's, it's really interesting. You know, some things flop and some things don't and some things really catch on. And, I'm not always sure which ones will. And, and you know, I would say that also to people who want to create things and, and even performers is that when you should always have the audience in mind, like everything I do is for the audience. Mm -hmm. Nothing is like, I believe the oboe should be this and people should respect it. It's like, no, that's a stupid philosophy. It, but it's like, I want, I want people to enjoy life. I want them to smile right now. I want, you know, I want them to have a positive response. Everything I do is sort of with that in mind. And sometimes, sometimes I don't, sometimes like it reaches a smaller audience and sometimes it reaches a larger one. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not always sure which one will be which. I actually didn't think the Fairling Reed, I thought that I, I put up number 28 um, because that was just the one I had done first compositionally. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, well, you know, people will, enjoyed or not and it became a big thing because mm -hmm. it, but but it wasn't you know i was putting up random videos all the time but it didn't have quite that response until then um and so and then you know i put up one where i was playing along just recently with like the the choir in harry potter mm -hmm. and on some platforms it did well on others it really didn't and i was like well that's interesting and then i put up the one with the the ragtime and that did really well on the other ones, but not well on the one that did well with Harry Potter. And so if you're creating things, you always want to keep in mind what the audience, what you want to do for the audience and what they want. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you may never, you might not know, and, and there are going to be hits and misses. And just the, the trick is to keep putting it out there and not, not doubt yourself. You can evaluate and try better, but don't, don't be like, well, this flopped. I guess I'm no good. You know, it's just like, no, just do, do something else, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know. <laughs> see you know try to figure out why it didn't work and do one that works that way <laughs> i think you're definitely successful in um the goal of creating the boring or mundane um to be fun and enjoyable because i personally had never learned all of the failing etudes until um this oh. This quarantine and then you know there was like a challenge to do you know 48 failings in 48 days Oh, Which nice. Oh, good. good for you. <laughs> um, but yes, it got a little predictable, I would say, throughout that. I was like, wait, this one sounds just like every <laughs> other one. Um, yeah, I forget what it is. It's like all of the ones that start with a dotted, they start with a pickup of a dotted eighth to 16. It's like number 39 and the, it's like number 39 and the B flat minor slow. And there's just like, there's like five of them. 
Mm -hmm. you can I actually try this. You can stack them all up, and if you put them in the same key signature, they just kind of go exactly. I, <laughs> yeah. you... <laughs> I definitely believe that. So I think your um, videos are even more helpful for people who have um, sense that they can be repetitive. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, yeah, and and it's like I think really. I'm not, I'm not a fundamentals guy. Like, I think that, that fundamentals are like money. Um, I don't have them. No, uh, but the fundamentals are like money uh, in the sense that they, they can help you, but they aren't an end in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. Like, if I did a concert and I came off the stage and someone said, my goodness, you, your technique is so good and it was so in tune, I would probably slit my wrist that night. I mean, I'd be like, what, like, that's what you got out of all this, right? Like, okay. like how, you know, um, whereas if I felt like I wasn't quite on with intonation or my fingers were a little sloppy, but people came up and said, oh my God, I cried at that moment, did it? Then that's, to me, that's more worth it. And, you know, if you, you can listen to the Hovhannes Mysterious Mountain, and it's true that if intonation isn't perfect in, in that first movement, then you are going to be losing some of the musical um, force of it because mm -hmm. one of the cool things is how consonant but how different everything is but still still beautiful mm -hmm. so it's like but that's a means to an end it, it's like so it's like practice intonation so you can do that right but just having good intonation is like just having money it's it's, it's not really it's nothing on its own unless it's being used to do something better so you know it's like what's the point of doing fairlings to do fairlings right mm -hmm. it, it, you know, there's, it's not really a valid end. So, mm. you know, detour is, uh, you made me think about this a little bit because you said, you know, what is a detour to you? And, and mm -hmm. so many times people think of a detour as kind of a, of a drag because, you know, it's, it's kind of a long way around something. It's not the most direct route, but you have mm. to go around something. And I was thinking about that. I said, you know, it's, it's, it may not be true though, because, because detours are placed there in order to avoid a larger obstacle. Mm -hmm. It might be quicker to go one way, but you're going to end up with a lot more problems. So they give you a detour. Go this way instead. It'll take longer, but it'll be, um, it'll, it'll, in the end, it'll be more beneficial. And you have the added thing of being in a place you didn't expect and having one more, one more aspect to your worldly experience, which mm -hmm. will make you a better artist. You'll have a lot of unexpected joys and unexpected setbacks, but all of that's good. Mm -hmm. And if you just really focus and go straight through without going through the detour, you can focus your way right into the ground and, and not be able to get out. It, it really is possible, especially if you're really dedicated. Mm -hmm. Sometimes being that focused can absolutely halt you in mm -hmm. your tracks. And so it's like, it takes some perspective to allow a detour to happen, to say, okay, what do I want? And do I need, do I need this or do I need that? And is this going to really affect me in the big picture or not? And mm -hmm. so, so I kind of see detours maybe being more like a scenic route almost where mm -hmm. they're more beneficial than not having them. They, they can benefit you more. I, I, as you know, I'm not a big believer in uh, the value of efficiency, except for simply just getting, getting work out there, but, but, mm -hmm. it, but not at the cost of the work. It's, it's kind of like do it as fast as you can do it perfectly. Mm -hmm. But any faster than that, and what's what's the point? Like, I mean, there's no medal for the time award, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so yeah. <laughs> uh, someone I had asked about interviewing in the past, um, who went to my undergraduate school, kind of emailed back saying, "Laura, do you think I'm like have some big failure that I need to tell you about?" I was like, "No, no, no!" Like, <laughs> and he felt like very insecure about the the word detour. I was like, "No, it just means you know a different path or something." unexpected and I'm like no I think this is actually like where your success like can shine more and then I think by the end I had him convinced that I wasn't trying to like get him to confess some <laughs> horrible things <laughs> yeah, all right it wasn't it wasn't some sort of hint like what yeah. failures have you had uh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, like, such a musician I mean every musician is like it, it, it's just yeah they're we're, we're, we're so desperate for affirmation on a subjective thing on a subjective mm -hmm so desperate for people to say that was it mm -hmm. that if they say oh yeah it was pretty good like instead of being like okay we're like what wasn't good about it? what wasn't good about it why am i not a good artist why am i a failure you know <laughs> it's, it's, and you know everybody um i, I there was another another little men, uh, oboe mentor of mine his, his name's joel tim uh 
and he he said he said everyone has imposter syndrome you know everyone has this you know whenever you walk into a gig you're like is this going to be the day where the house of cards falls down and everyone realizes that I actually suck and I have no business being here. You know, is it going to be today when I walk in? And certainly I, I felt that when I was getting my first studio jobs of walking in and, you know, and just being like, they're going to, you know, if I don't, people are going to think I suck and you get, you get very few chances, you know, before people move on. So, um, yeah, I remember thinking like, is this going to be where everyone knows that I, I as I put it uh, to Adam DeSorgo, I was talking to him at one point. I said, I said, I feel like a stowaway. I feel like, I feel like someone who snuck in and is getting work and is doing these things. And then, you know, so it, it never goes away, but you know, that's, that's just because it's subjective. If we were doing something that had a definitive yes or no, mm -hmm. um, we wouldn't need that, but then our lives would be much more boring too because we wouldn't be in this nebulous world of of you know art which which mm -hmm. is something you know <laughs> it is also very important for all musicians especially young musicians to hear like this is normal everyone feels this way because like you were saying we read the bio that's 500 words and you're like this person's perfect and i'm not so but it's right. nice to know that everyone feels that way there was a, a young player uh, that asked me, she said, you know, oh, I want to, I want to go into oboe, but I don't think I'm good enough, you know, and I, I remember thinking like, again, like, yeah, take a number, right, <laughs> right, you know, that doesn't set you apart, but uh, what, what, what I said, which was more, even more true, is, um, is that, you know, they're saying you're not, or, or feeling like you're not good enough, is a, is kind of a blessing because it means something it one it means that you know there's a higher standard you can hear you have an ear that's developed enough to know that there's something beyond what you're doing that you need to get to mm -hmm. if you have that your whole career you'll always be getting better you'll always be trying to be the best you can be and that that scale is going to move up and up and up the more you accomplish it's you're never going to catch up to it hopefully mm -hmm. the moment you catch up to it you're really kind of out of ideas at that point so um, and you should probably just retire, <laughs> um, uh, even if you're 18, right? I mean, if you're at that point. So, um, so I said, you know, you're good enough to know there's a higher standard. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to set you apart from a lot of people going into music school. If, if you can understand that going in, mm -hmm. you're in a better spot than most of them because you'll be trying to get further instead of resting on what you have. And I said also, the music building does, the music industry does not pull its punches. Um, it'll tell you very definitively whether you belong there or not in very cruel and uncertain terms. Mm -hmm. So you might as well make it tell you. I mean, why, you know, like, I mean, it, it will. If you're not good enough, it'll smack you down really hard. Repeat it. Even if you're good, it'll mm -hmm. smack you down repeatedly, you know. So make it. Put the onus on, the, uh, uh, on them to say, no, you are not a good musician. Or, or the, the onus on the audience to say, this isn't what we want and we're not mm -hmm. coming anymore. That'll start to rack your brain of like, okay, well, how can I do this better so that they want, you know, what I'm doing? How can I offer something that they want? Um, and, and that'll always lead you pretty well. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a crazy, it's a crazy world, but being flexible and, and, even more than being flexible, just knowing, like I'm not flexible on what I want, right? If I was flexible on what I wanted, I would have stayed in the orchestras and, mm -hmm. and just, you know, been doing that. And I would have played Beethoven five about 12 more times than I have, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 you know, look, there's some people that love that and, and that's cool. There, there, there are many brilliant musicians who do that that are, that are magnificent players. Um, but, but to me, I needed more out of what was happening. And so, mm -hmm. Or I need maybe not more, but something different because I, I'm not going to necessarily say that that to everybody in the world what I want out of it is is any better or or any, in any way. So, um, mm -hmm. but I wanted it to be different, and um, so I yeah. So you know, it's the digital age. There are no rules anymore. So you yeah. can um, so so have in mind what you want. Like as you see adversity, as you see changes of plan, you know what do you really want? What, what do you really want? Because because it wasn't until I got to the goal where I realized that, oh, you know, this isn't exactly what I wanted. Why is that? Like, you know, maybe I should have taken more detours <laughs> than I did. So, yeah. um, you know, making up for it now, I guess. But. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are some of your goals right now for your various 
um, jobs. <laughs> Various jobs. Well, yes, right now, um, right now, um, ensemble recording uh, is a little bit uh, restricted, of course, and live performances are all canceled here and probably will be till 2021 or so. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, I looked at, um, for, for my record label, I looked at all the albums I wanted to put out and I made a marking of which ones I could do under quarantine and which ones I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And to my surprise, um, about 15 of the 30 that I have on my little spreadsheet, it's one of the only times I use a spreadsheet, but uh, it's good to, it's like a pencil that can keep your thoughts straight as you, as you get there. Um, but uh, I realized that I could do a lot of them. And, and, and even if I didn't do complete albums, I could get them going and try them out, throw them out there and just see, um, see how audiences reacted to them. And if they hit something good, then I would continue to do those and complete the album. If they fell flat for some reason, then, you know, I would, I would move on to one of the others and just, it's, it's, so I'm, I'm kind of right now really focusing on being a recording artist. There are uh, some films that have been calling me to record in my own house. Again, this is good. I have my own studio set up. I figured out how to do all that. And, um, and experimented a lot with microphones. So um, yeah, like there's there's a few movies that are gonna be uh, you know, out that I'll be playing on that I recorded in my apartment and they just threw them in with uh, the track. So cool. doing that too, uh, our chamber group, Helix Collective, we're, we're preparing kind of like an online release of, uh, since we can't do a concert, it's gonna be like an online goodie bag of uh, things that we can offer, um, again, recorded, recorded remotely and things. So we're working on that. And I'm also writing my very first uh, choral work uh, or choral set of works, which, which I, I haven't really done, done very serious choral work before. So it's, it's kind of interesting as a composer. Um, it also involves um, creating my own instruments and uh, uh, my own language. It, it's, it's a long story about how it came up. <laughs> but anyway, it's been very involved and a lot of fun uh, to mm -hmm. write. So I, I'm keeping busy. Um, it's, you know, look, I mean, this is where composing can be helpful. Like, you, yeah. you know, there's nothing that a composer wants more than to be shoved into a room for four months and said, you can't go outside and just all you have is this in your keyboard, you know, and they're like, <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, I mean, no, no distraction, no, no obligation. Um, it's, let's write, you know. So I'm trying to use that to my advantage. Uh, yeah. And uh, so by the end of this, um, especially since now they're rolling back, <laughs> the, now that they're rolling back the, the openings and, and it seems like it'll be longer, I'm pretty, pretty sure, reasonably sure I'll finish, um, mm -hmm. barring any unexpected detours. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, so uh, I'm working on those, all of them with the same general idea that I want to, pro especially now, I want to uh, provide things that people can enjoy and make their lives better. Um, and, uh, it, you know, even though they might be stuck inside and can't party and can't go to the beach and can't do mm -hmm. all these things, to, to make something that I can make them feel good at home uh, through, the, through the elbow. So. Yes. Or you want to make some magic like you saw when you were. <laughs> right, exactly. It still makes some magic. And I mean, again, the digital revolution is a magnificent thing. And, and I, I don't think, I, I think. The, I'm not, it's been a while since I've been in school, um, but at least when I was there, it was pre-digital revolution really. And so we weren't taught anything about microphones and digital audio workstations, mm -hmm. um, you know, sound editing, electronic loops and tracks. We never studied any of that. Um, but hopefully the music schools are now, I don't know if they are, but they should be because the digital revolution is making it possible to do all of this stuff with very little cost. I mean, to put out an album used to be tens of thousands of dollars to do, and you can do it now. I mean, man, I mean, it, it may not sound great, but you could conceivably do it on free stuff like GarageBand mm -hmm. and, and Audacity. It may not sound great, but it would be the difference of it being done or not done if you don't have a few grand. Um, and even Pro Tools is, is, is really only $600, and that's a lot of money, but, compared to the amount of albums you can put out with Pro Tools and how quickly you can do it, 600 is nothing compared to having, you know, you, know you, could, you could put out albums the rest of your life on, on a profession, on an absolutely top professional level through Pro Tools for 600 bucks mm -hmm. compared to the multiple thousands it would take, to, it would have taken to do it in the 80s or 90s. So um, 
you know, I think, I think, I hope musicians can, especially dancers and, and classical musicians can really take that bull by the horns because we, we could do a lot of fun, we, we could do a lot of fun things with it, a lot of great things with it. That's yeah. definitely the silver lining for a lot of musicians and artists during like a lockdown situation is that, oh, we actually have the tools to continue to grow um, and produce. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much um, for oh, speaking with me today. <laughs> It's really cool that you're doing this. It's, uh, you. I mean, you know, I mean, here, are, here we are talking about like, you know, creating your own, your own thing and doing the things that you think are important. And so this is a, a good example of that, you know, you. That started this up and you have the ability to do it. You're not scared mm -hmm. of hosting a podcast and, you know, getting it recorded and edited and, mm -hmm. and providing something that people need. So that's exact. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm right, right with you on this. And I think it's really impressive that you've done it. So thank so. you. I hope you enjoyed listening to that as much as I enjoyed being a part of the conversation. There were two main points that Phil mentioned that have really stuck with me. One of them being not everybody can do everything. I know that I personally tend to think that I can do everything if I just spent a little bit more time, but it is a nice realization and kind of a lift of the pressure that you actually don't have to do everything. The other thing that I keep thinking about is that things aren't going to go the way you planned. It's not possible for your life to be as picture perfect as you may hope, but instead to actually look forward to those detour moments where you're going to grow the most. If you'd like to keep up with the podcast, there are multiple ways you can do so. First of all, you can go to our website, which is detoursandmusicpodcast.weebly.com. You could also subscribe to our YouTube channel, also called Detours and Music Podcast. We also have a Facebook page and Instagram account where you can like and follow us. The Detours in Music podcast is available everywhere that you listen to podcasts, but on Apple Music podcast apps, you can subscribe and rate us. If you ever want to get in touch with me and give more direct feedback, you can email me at detoursinmusicpodcast at gmail.com. As always, thank you for listening, and I hope you catch the next one.